So I like to read pretty much whatever I could get my hands on, but there was one particular thing as a farm kid in northern Wisconsin that I really loved to read. And um, there was a time, even within the scope of my memory, and I'm, I'm just uh, 46 now, but even within the scope of my memory, when kids would look forward to the arrival of the J.C. Penney Christmas catalog. And nowadays, of course, you get 15, 20 catalogs a week. But back then, the Sears and J.C. Penney catalogs would come, oh, three, four times a year. And the Christmas edition was extra thick and stuffed with unattainable goodies. Uh, I know my brothers and I would leave it lying around the house open to the go-kart page. <laughs> we just relying on the power of suggestion, which frankly yielded diddly. Uh, we never did get a go-kart. We had to settle for giving each other rides in the barn cleaner. <laughs> Which is exciting in its own way. Um, as I told the people in San Francisco, it's kind of like super slow-mo surfing. although you wouldn't necessarily want to do it barefoot. Um, <laughs> but anyways, my brothers and sisters and I would look forward to the arrival of the Christmas catalogs, but we were farm kids, so what we really looked forward to was the arrival of the American Breeders Service Bull Catalog. <laughs> now, if you're not familiar, the ABS catalog is basically Playgirl for Cows. <laughs> it's filled with page after page of photographs of the ultimate bulls. These are the Greek gods of the bovine world. And they always had these amazing four-part names. I remember one of the big ones when I was a kid was something, 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 Belshazzar. <laughs> right out of the Old Testament. And they always had names like Golden Turkish Alfalfa Rocket. <laughs> so my brothers and I, we'd get that catalog and we'd go through and we'd look at all the photographs. And then also, in addition to the photographs, each bull's photograph was accompanied by a little chart of data that broke down the different traits and attributes that he caused to come forth in the cows he created. I remember there was one section called Rolling Butterfat Average. Uh, there was another section titled Utter Tilt. <laughs> We'd study that one pretty close. But anyway, so we would study all these photographs and all this data, and then we'd say, Dad, Dad, this bull here, Spanky Tango Cremora Blaster. <laughs> He's the one for our cows. And I'm pretty sure, uh, based on what I didn't know then, but do know now about my parents' financial situation at the time, that Dad just went to the back of the catalog, uh, to the discount section. <laughs> bull in a bucket. <laughs> and, and just ordered the cheapest product available. But then sometime within the next eight hours, the artificial inseminator would arrive. And he would walk into the barn and commit astounding acts. When you're a kid growing up on a remote northern Wisconsin dairy farm with no TV, <laughs> the artificial inseminator's pretty much the best thing going. <laughs> and we never missed it, boy. We. <laughs> Because he would roll into the yard, and in the back of his pickup, he'd have this little silver canister, about the size of a beer pony, and that was filled with liquid nitrogen. 
and that's where the frozen semen was stored. And when he'd, he'd pop the top off that canister and these wisps of mysterious fog would roll up and down the sides. And if he had time and he liked you, he'd let you take a length of string and dip it into the liquid nitrogen. And when you pulled it out, it was so deep frozen you could crack it just like a twig. And so he would, he would extract the, the little ampule of, of semen and thaw it out and put it into a little squeezy syringy type thing, which he would then attach to a long slender pipette. And at that point, I don't know if <clears throat> this was standard operating procedure <laughs> or just our guy's particular personal flair, <laughs> but he would then carry that device crossways in his teeth. Because <laughs> I remember we'd be in the barn there waiting for him and, and he would step through the barn door backlit by the sun <laughs> and he'd have on those big tall rubber boots and that thing crossways in his teeth. And I was always reminded of a pirate boarding a ship. <laughs> and I have to assume the cows had a similar reaction. <laughs> but anyways, Dad would, would hang a tag behind the cow he wanted serviced, and the inseminator would locate the tag, and thus the cow, and he would stop behind her, and he would draw on a long, shoulder-length plastic glove, <laughs> And then he would step across the gutter and he would grab the cow by the tail. And then I always say, if you don't know the rest, see me after class. <laughs> and I, I can't say that the cows were ever all that visibly upset by what certainly had to be a disruption in their day. There's really only two outward signs, and the first is that they'd, they'd stop chewing their cud. They'd go... <laughs> and then their eyes would bulge, not a lot, just a little. Uh, kind of like if you was walking down the street and you went, I was supposed to pay my taxes yesterday. But anyway, in addition to the bulls and their data chart, each page in the ABS catalog also contained a couple of portraits of some of the cows that had been cast by these bulls. And if the bulls were the Greek gods of the bovine world, these cows were the Pamela Andersons, okay? <laughs> they left a farm boy slightly breathless. And it has been a long time since cows played a central role in my life, but they still occupy my thoughts. <laughs> and so a while back, I was given the opportunity to write a description of my dream cow, and I would like to share that with you now. Uh, it's, it has no beginning and no end, it's just a description, and of course I'm from Chippewa County, Wisconsin, so thus the name. There was, in Chippewa County, a cow that would make you despair all other cows. A gloriously big-boned Holstein, deep in the forerib, long in the spine, and fronted with a brisket the lines of which brought to mind the prow of a felted barkentine. Her dewlap rose to a sturdy throat, which gave way to a sweeping jawbone, which attached to a generally trapezoidal skull, crowned with a bony pompadour. Her eyes were translucent brown dewdrops the size of mallard eggs, fringed with delicate swaths of lash. Her nose, pebbled and moist, was the size of a large boxing glove, the nostrils, while large enough to admit an English sparrow each. <laughs> were delicately drawn, and her breath, grassy with just a hint of hops, 
was not unpleasant. A stern, her sturdy, up-tilted tail head rose from betwixt the twin thurls of an architectural backside, the tail itself dropping on a straight, clean line past her pin bones to her hocks, where it plumed and fluffed to a voluminous switch that whispered against her dew claws when she walked. <laughs> Girthy but firm at 1,800 pounds, the Holstein stood 60 inches at the withers, poised on clean hooves, and draped nose to heels in a tight-napped pelt the color of drift snow and coal tar. At the vertex of flank and thigh, her udder bloomed a sculpted marvel, big as a bushel, firm as a block of butter, boldly veined, furred with clean white hair, the texture of toasted velour, and anchored by twin milk veins running the abdomen like woolly ropes. The teats. <laughs> Arranged about the four corners in a dignified quartet. <laughs> were sturdy, but symmetrical and gracefully tapered. To press your cheek against this udder was to worship at the terminus of a genetic journey traceable to the Batavians and Frisians who first mingled their herds in the Rhine Delta around the time of Christ. This was a temple to butterfat, a shrine to calcium and cream, a ruminant Helen capable of launching a thousand milk mustaches. This was a glorious clover-fueled bovine dream. This was Chippewa's Chipper Princess Turbaline. As I said, cows don't play a central role in my life anymore, but my brother still farms, and he heard me read that piece one time, and then afterward, he came up to me and said, stay out of my barn. <laughs>